back at it again. It's Chris Gentry here with C. Gentry, and we are at different digs, but the same content, right? We are taking deep dives, different perspectives, and we're looking at it for an international audience to understand what's going on in Haiti and to understand it from the perspective of there might be something better. There might be something that mainstream media isn't telling you. So we're here. I want to thank you guys. Make sure you like, you comment, and you subscribe with you and with me. Together, Haiti can change. I want to take a quick second to let you guys know we have a sponsor for this video. Sponsor is Simple Sun Haitian brand from Hyper Distribution. <laughs> It's a really interesting concept, guys. We have an export company, and we're bringing products out of Haiti. A lot of these products aren't necessarily our products. But the Simple Sign Sand brand is the brand I stand behind. It's the brand of products that are guaranteed to be out of Haiti. And staple products that every purchase, you can be rest assured. When we go out and rebuy, they're going to help and sustain a farmer. They're going to help sustain a producer. They're going to help to sustain a family in Haiti. What are the products? You can find all these right now on Amazon. Simple Sun Brand Cassava, directly out of Cap Haitian. Delicious sugar. Check it out. Junjo. It's a Haitian mushroom used for one of our most important dishes. The Haitian Jean Jean rice, right there. Dushila, earthy, nutritious rice out of La Atibonite Valley, available to you. Boule chocolat. Ooh, cool summer day. Nothing beats Haitian chocolate, right? All these that I just showed you, you can buy them on cgenty.com forward slash shop they will take you to a link and you'll be able to buy them on Amazon and a lot of these a lot of these have same day to next day delivery thanks for supporting back to the show we're going to talk about today a very important topic one of the probably top topics I've had while I was away and folks wanted to for, for us for me to weigh in on and uh, and, and here it is we're talking about the intervention. We're going to be talking about, most importantly, apparently Kenya coming in. And we're going to talk about the implications and what that really means. And will it be effective? The first part in our series, and, and it's really important to understand, is to understand how we got here. Haiti does not have a historic issue with gangs. Haiti does not have an historic issue with kidnapping. Haiti doesn't have an historic issue with insecurity. Despite having a justice system that is notoriously inefficient in what it does, Haiti and Haitians in particular have never been known to be violent, have never been known to be particularly abusive. There's never been, for example, terrorism on the island, right? So there's certain lines that Haiti, despite a reputation of poverty, never crossed into until recently. And recently, perhaps for us, it goes back specifically to early 2000s. In early 2000s, we saw a spike, a spike in what can only be described as very curious and very suspicious uptick of guns flowing into the country, a very suspicious uptick of organization around, yes, there were always groups, I guess you can say, of downtrodden individuals who would take advantage of the spaces they existed to do acts of thievery, to do acts of what Haitians would call banditry. Never in this degree and never this organized. What was going on at the time? Simple. We had an unpopular president, Jovenel Moise, who, despite many other 
things done that typically would have caused consternation and uh, a reaction <laughs> uh, by the public community and even internally. Jovenel was stubborn. President Jovenel was a stubborn person. And during his time in office, made a lot of people angry. <laughs> From the prior president who put him in place that he did not follow directions, to the donors that put him in place that did not receive special kickbacks. From the politicians who were used to getting service for parliamentary actions that they, they didn't receive despite being part of the PHT, his party. And the usual dissidents uh, in the lower rung of society who felt, per usual, they did not have a voice compared to prior presidents who at least gave the feeling that they were really generally working with the masses and the masses believed them. Jovenel never got that. And unfortunately, Jovenel never mastered the art of politics, the art of how to appease one group versus another. But yet, he remained. And just like other times in prior periods of Haitian history, we saw a preference for violence. We saw it under Duvalier, we saw it under Aristide, and unfortunately we're seeing it again under Jovia. And some folks would argue he started it. There's incident in Bel Air where we saw, we saw heinous things occur where only those who were most apt to benefit were the government or the administration, right? So one could connect that as maybe the first instance of violence occurring uh, against the population, right? But very quickly, there was an up push of violence occurring, and that was occurring indiscriminately and chaotically. It continued to escalate until July, early July. 2021. Because at that point, the president, Joe Moïse, would be assassinated in his home. Very shortly after, uh, Claude Joseph would assume control, but very quickly there would be a decision made to have Prime Minister Ariel Henry, who was, who was recently nominated just a few days before Joe Moïse's assassination, to officially take power uh, on July 20th, 2021. The gangs in particular have crept and crept until they've basically taken uh, large swaths of the country, Port-au-Prince being an epicenter. La Tibonite Valley is another place that has seen a tremendous uptick in gang violence. But Port-au-Prince with a very large percentage of the population, and most importantly, the economic engine of the country, where so much of what makes the country run sits, has seen a tremendous concentration. And really, for the first time in the history of Haiti, we have internal refugee crises occurring within communities, within communes, within city blocks that are taken over by one gang being defended by another gang, with civilians being ca caught up in the crossfire, and during lows of violence, leaving, and many of these citizens sleeping on the streets in neighboring communes where they've sought shelter, something we've never seen. We can, when we look at the map, there's regions in City Soleil, which has always been in a hotbed area, areas of Matissa that have been hotbeds uh, traditionally as well, but have just overrun to the point where it's really become a no man's land. We have areas of Quarabuque, uh, that a very large area, uh, but similarly very dangerous to cross over and, 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 and go into for any reason. And, and what's most interesting about this current crisis is the fact that there doesn't seem to be safety anywhere, even in the uphills of Pitchellville up into Laboul, which has been traditionally very, you know, well-off 
or some of the well-off, more you know, well-to-do Haitians have resided. The gangs have even found themselves up there warring, fighting for territory, and similarly kidnapping and driving insecurity in those areas as well. The gang crisis has truly gone out of hand, and the government has said they need help in fighting it. They cannot do it themselves. It's important to, and this is truly where the drum beat for intervention began. There was an understanding by those at the helm of power, particularly Ariel, and uh, another key player to understand here, United Nations Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez, who was very adamant that there needed to be a new interve inter interventionist force in Haiti. Antonio Gutierrez wasn't alone. There is a group called the Core Group. The Core Group is made of United Nations, the United States, Canada, Germany, France, Brazil, and a handful of other countries that are very closely intertwined with the quote-unquote needed management, end quote, of Haiti and Haiti's affairs. And they, there was a very clear need, per what they expressed, for intervention. The United States in particular was one of the loudest voices, but they did not want to lead <laughs> the inter interventionist force. Why? Because there were prior interventions most recently in the early 90s, where the U.S. took the lead, and it did not fare well, particularly for the public perception of the United States and the United States Army. They did not want to go back down that road. Additional interventions, probably the most, uh, most known, was MINUSTA that occurred in 2004, and it would only end in 2017, though in a different form. Formerly, it wasn't until about 2018, 2019 that it ended, uh, for truly, truly. Those who took the lead then was Brazil. And Brazil did not want to take the lead again, despite the fact the president who was in power then, Lula da Silva, would, within a reasonable amount of time, be reelected and be in a position to approve. But he was very clear this time it wasn't happening <laughs> under his watch, not with Brazil taking the lead. There was a clear, there was a desire for someone to take the lead. And this is where Kenya comes into the picture of Africa would not gain its independence until 1964. Bear in mind, Haiti got its independence in 1804. So there's a significant gap over 150 plus years between both countries. Now, I say this just to say, we had a much longer time to get our ish together, right? And some folks argue that, hey, you know what? It's an African country. Great. <laughs> At least it's one of our brothers at arms taking the charge. However, during a recent visit headed by their Deputy Inspector General, Noor Gabo, along with other individuals in their police and foreign ministry, there has been a disagreement in terms of how to best move forward. It's been expressed by the Miami Herald that the Kenya delegation, upon their visit, thought that a better strategy would not necessarily be to go after the gangs, of which Ariel Henry and the government wants them to take, but rather it would be a much better strategy to circle key infrastructure, airports, ports, other areas uh, of particular commercial and governmental importance, leaving to the devices everywhere else, which is certainly not what the government would want. What would the government want? They would want someone to come in and clean their mess, right? Kenya left, and sort and since then there's been quite a quiet amongst. Uh, Kenya and the move forward. As I talked to you today, and this it's in about mid-September, the UN is supposed to provide a resolution that will uh, allow a formal uh, act for the intervention to happen. Assuming, of course, Kenya still wants to be the lead, there is quite the gap between what the government needs 
and ultimately what the intervention is saying that they're going to go in terms of direction. One of the key things we have to ask yourself is, has there been prior instances where an intervention from the United Nations in particular, anywhere in the world, was successful in solving a domestic security issue such as we're seeing right now in Haiti. Let's look at the facts. We don't have to look too far in history to see examples of interventions that occurred to help uh, with a country's domestic situation. In 1999, Kosovo had an incredible crisis. Ethnic tensions boiled up between Serbians and Albanians and violence would begin and go past any meaningful line to an outbreak effectively of a civil war. Some would argue that that intervention ultimately was successful. It ended the internal crisis and led to a period of peace that, though fragile, still sustains today. Another, again, 1999, was the UN's intervention in Liberia. There was a decades-long civil war occurring at the time, and their intervention directly came, brought about a peace. So, so, thus far, two for two. But there's been other interventions that have not been successful. The Rwanda civil war, that, as we know, had terrible genocidal consequences. The UN was in place and did not act. The Yemen civil war, South Sudan, and missions in countries that include Burundi, Congo, Ethiopia, Angola, Mozambique. The list, I'm, I'm sort of running out of fingers when it comes to situations where the UN has come in and achieved less than desired results in terms of the peace and security of a country. And in most of these cases that I've expressed, when the UN finally decided to kaitel it, Similar to how we saw in Haiti, we saw a derailment in that country's security situation. So where do we go from here? Would you be interested to know the estimated cost of this upcoming intervention, directly from the U.S. State Department? It's going to cost $400 million a year to sustain the military intervention in Haiti. 400 million, 400 million <laughs> to sustain the intervention in Haiti. The Haiti has two forces that could potentially, that, that, that are there to help with insecurity. The first is PNH, the Police National Haiti, which is a police force, and Fariash, which is the Force Armée de Haïti, Haiti's Armed Forces. Since 1990, the latter has been, well, first disbanded and, and then only put back to place recently by Jovenel Moïse himself in 2000. But despite that, there's still regulations in place to prevent the army from acquiring weapons and acquiring weaponry that could potentially assist. When they came back, to, came back, when they came back, they were to be used as a environmental force to help with natural disasters and other special instances that were technically and formally outside the scope of the National Police of Haiti. Both forces, believe it or not, <laughs> ready for the budgets. In 2021, the budget for PNH was 11.5 million. In 2021, the budget for the armed forces, not too far away, at 9.4 million. Again, 400 million for the intervention for one year, a total of 21 million, give or take, for the current security forces of Haiti. One would argue if it was been so hard to take, to find someone to lead the intervention, and even the country that has stepped up only really wants a limited role in, in how they want to tackle the situation. Would it not make sense to empower those who are in the country 
who have the volunteer, as we would say in Haiti, to tackle on this challenge and who have the most to gain. And at the end of the day, not too many other countries are going to want to send their, their, their sons, their daughters, to fight in a country, die in a country, be injured in a country that isn't theirs. Would it make sense? Recently, there was a movement led by the population, the PEP, the, the gentry of the country called Bois Cali, where normal citizens would take rocks, shetties, sticks, whatever they could find, and go directly and to fight against the bandits. Some areas were more successful than others. Some areas saw multiple bandits killed uh, within a particular operation. Again, all by citizens. But simultaneously, the bandits would fight back, and would, when they fought back, it was not a particular good scene for the population because they had automatic weapons and the citizenry had sticks, machetes, and rocks. But it goes to show you that there is a desire, there is a wanting, there is volonté for patience to solve this issue. However, the resources are lacking. Give them the resources. And as time has gone on, this idea potentially may get more and more force. Potentially. Because right now, Haiti is in a quagmire that there doesn't quite seem to be a way out. Except, potentially, to build up its own capacity to take care of itself. This has been Chris Jancy of C. Jancy. This is what we do here. We do deep dives, deeper perspectives longer conversations to have hope that you better understand the dynamics and what's going on in the country. If you like what's going on here, give us a description. By the way, what did you think about this crisis? Do you believe we should build up our own security forces? Perhaps the history doesn't lead to a positive end for us. Maybe we shouldn't. Leave your comment below. If you enjoyed this conversation, give us a like, definitely share this video, and thank you for giving us a watch. We'll be back at it again, and we're back at it again. Peace.